Many see your villain as an extraordinary talent in Formula One, someone who can skillfully maneuver a car to its limits and make it seem like a graceful dance. His unique personality captivates everyone who crosses his path. Despite having only six wins on paper, watching him drive reveals the true significance of his abilities. Those who raced alongside him attest that he had no equal on the track. The tragic death of Jill during the 1982 Belgian Grand Prix qualifying left the motorsports community in shock. For many, it felt like the loss of the best talent in the world of motor racing. Jill remains a cherished hero in Canada, serving as an inspiration to countless individuals. Three years after his passing, a young man from Maple Ridge embarked on his go-karting journey, becoming the 99th member of the Westwood Karting Club. He was assigned the number 99, a symbol that would become synonymous with his name, Greg Moore. He was a bit of a funny-looking kid, but he was really good at sports, especially hockey and racing. When he was six, he got his first go-kart and started driving around at his dad's car shop while also playing hockey as a goalie. When he was 10, he started racing in proper competitions with carts. But when he turned 14, he had to choose between continuing with hockey or spending hours driving expensive cars in circles. He chose the second option because it sounded more exciting to him. Greg could have done well in hockey too. He won the Maple Ridge Athlete of the Year award twice and even won the British Columbia Hockey Provincial Championship. But he was tired of hockey and all the training that came with it. He loved racing more. In hockey, you can't control everything, but in racing, you have more control, and Greg was really good at controlling cars. He learned this from his dad, who once made him drive on a wet track with dry tires, which was not fun at all. His dad was tough on him. If Greg forgot his neck brace for racing, they would go home without even practicing. Greg's dad was a race driver too, and he believed in tough love to make Greg a better racer. And it worked. With his natural instincts and exceptional driving skills, he dominated the 1989 North American Enduro Kart Racing Championship, despite facing challenges like spinning off in the rain and falling behind. However, he made a remarkable comeback, securing a win that showcased his promising future in the sport. Transitioning from kart racing, he enrolled in a racing school in Shannonville, Ontario, where his impressive abilities stood out among competitors older than him leading him to triumph in the Top Gun series. Recognizing his potential, the decision was made to transition Greg to car racing. A Formula Ford was acquired from the UK, marking Greg's debut in the Canadian Formula Ford Championship. Despite operating on a limited budget, he quickly made an impact, finishing second in his first car race and later securing a win. Greg's exceptional talent overshadowed the resource-rich competition, earning him the title of Rookie of the Year despite finishing fourth in the standings. The following year saw Greg's transition to Formula 4 2000, where he displayed early speed. By the fourth round in Las Vegas, he had claimed the championship and Rookie of the Year honors. Seeking a new challenge, the Moors eyed Formula Atlantic, but age restrictions prompted them to approach the Indy Lights series. Despite reservations about having a driver under 18, Greg's proven track record earned him a spot on the grid defying expectations with his prowess behind the wheel. Although his appearance might have resembled a math tutor, it was the trophies in his cabinet that spoke volumes about his driving capabilities. In the beginning, Greg Moore was still learning the ropes on road courses, but when it came to oval tracks, he was incredibly fast, maybe even too fast for the equipment he had. The 1993 season in Indy Lights was a learning experience, but those in the know recognized his speed. Moving into 1994, Greg dominated the first round and won two more races. However, the family team was struggling financially. Even with prize money, they were barely scraping by, mortgaging their home and seeking help from family members to finish the season. To continue racing, they needed more funding. And fortunately, Greg caught the eye of players, a breakthrough since they typically favored Quebec-based racers. Despite Greg not fitting the French-sounding mold, his Canadian roots and exceptional speed convinced them to support him. Now backed by sponsorship, Greg joined Forsyth Racing in 1995, where he dominated 10 out of 12 races, securing the championship. His success caught the attention of IndyCar, specifically Kart, known for high-speed racing. In 1996, Greg's debut at Homestead Miami started well with a sixth-place qualification, but a penalty for an illegal overtakes set him back a lap. Undeterred, Greg weaved through the field, passing the leader and finishing seventh. Although not a victory, spectators sensed something special in his performance, marking the beginning of Greg Moore's journey into the intense world of IndyCar racing in the late 90s. 
Greg's journey in IndyCar racing with the Forsyth team, powered by Mercedes-Benz engines, began on a positive note. Norbert Haug, the team manager, recognized Greg's talent, even as he competed alongside renowned drivers like Mika Hakkinen. The first race showcased Greg's potential, and doubts lingered if it was just a one-time success. The following race erased those doubts. Qualifying in fourth and leading the race with only a few laps left, Greg seemed destined for his first IndyCar victory. However, fate took a cruel turn, and his engine failed, symbolizing the highs and lows of his season. Despite sporadic successes, observers sensed the extraordinary capabilities of this young racer. His ninth place finish that year didn't reflect his true potential. In 1997, Greg's determination intensified. Despite consistent strong performances, victory eluded him until the Milwaukee Mile race. Strategic decisions and Greg's unique ability to conserve fuel and navigate corners secured his first win. This triumph continued in Detroit Belle Isle, where he became the series' youngest winner. Greg's distinctive style, symbolized by his iconic number 99 and red gloves, endeared him to fans. However, the latter part of the season brought disappointment, marked by multiple retirements due to engine failures and collisions. Despite occasional mistakes, Greg's resilience stood out. As the season concluded, optimism loomed for 1998, where fans hoped luck would finally favor this promising racer. In that year, Greg Moore kicked things off with a fantastic start, securing the top spot in the first race, even though he didn't win. His performance remained impressive and steady throughout the initial part of the season. A notable highlight occurred in Rio, where, in a thrilling moment, he skillfully overtook the reigning champion, Alex Zanardi, securing the lead after a daring move. This exceptional maneuver caught the attention of racing bigwigs like Frank Williams, Jackie Stewart, and Gene Todd. Despite being well-regarded in American open-wheel racing, Moore faced challenges in Formula One. After leading the championship following his Rio win, mechanical failures plagued his season, causing frustration. While he believed in his championship potential, his attempts to compensate for poor results by pushing too hard led to crashes. Off the track, Moore was part of the Brat Pack, a group known for their playful antics, including scooter races in the paddock. However, when racing, he remained focused and determined. During the US 500, a rival event to the Indy 500, Moore showcased his skill by strategically using drafting to secure a victory against formidable competitors like Zanardi and Vassar. Despite a challenging second half of the season, Moore's win at the US 500 highlighted his exceptional talent. His ability to balance fun off the track with seriousness on it endeared him to fans. The season, marked by highs and lows, showcased Moore's resilience and skill, making him a noteworthy figure in both American open-wheel racing and the world of Formula One. Despite the joy they felt in winning, this race served as a frightening reminder of the risks in their sport. On lap 175, Adrian Fernandez crashed into the wall, causing his front right wheel to fly into the stands, resulting in the tragic deaths of three spectators. While fatalities were not common in racing, they weren't rare either. Just two years earlier, Jeff Krosnoff and track official Gary Avrin lost their lives in a crash in Toronto. Greg's father Rick told him that the risk of losing one's life while pursuing their passion was an inherent part of racing. The dangers of the sport were as evident in 98 as they were in 96, but Greg's focus was on the upcoming 99 season. In 99, Greg started strong with the slogan, Miami pole position, race win. However, the Mercedes engine used by Forsyth proved to be less competitive as the season progressed, with Honda emerging as the preferred choice. In his fourth year in the category, Greg lacked a championship title, and he felt the need for a platform to showcase his skills, similar to his dominance in the 95 Indy Lights. Recognizing that Forsyth might not be the right fit anymore, he signed with Penske before the year ended, aiming for a fresh start. However, tragedy struck during practice for the Laguna Seca round, as promising driver Gonzalo Rodriguez lost his life in a crash. Despite the somber atmosphere, Greg remained focused on completing the championship with Forsyth. The Mercedes engine was ineffective on road courses, but on ovals, it was a potent force. The season finale in Fontana, California, offered a million-dollar prize, but Greg faced adversity when a pickup truck hit him while riding a scooter in the paddock, resulting in injuries to his hand, fingers, and hip. Undeterred, Greg insisted on racing with 15 stitches on his finger. 
Drawing on his experience playing hurt in hockey and karting, he embraced the challenge. The race, where speeds reached 230 miles per hour, became a testament to Greg's determination and resilience in the face of adversity. Greg Moore, a talented racer, embarked on the race from the 26th position, sharing a lighthearted banter with his friend Tony Kanan, positioned 10th, saying, uh, give me a couple of laps and I'll be up there with you. Surprisingly, Greg turned this jest into reality, swiftly advancing after just two laps. Fueled by determination and a desire to conclude his racing journey on a high note with Forsyth and players, the entities that provided him with the opportunity to enter the racing world, Greg charged through the field. As the race unfolded, an incident occurred involving Richie Hearn, who spun off and collided with the barrier on the back straight. Fortunately, Hearn emerged unscathed, but the incident raised awareness about the potential risks in racing, even with enhanced safety measures. On the ninth lap, the race resumed, but tragedy struck when Greg spun off in the same location as Hearn. The crash was catastrophic, with the car airborne before slamming into the wall at a devastating angle, registering a shocking 154 Gs. Greg was thrown headfirst into a barrier, and at 121 Pacific time, he was declared deceased. The atmosphere at the Speedway turned somber as the racing community mourned the loss of one of its beloved figures. In the aftermath, the number 99 was retired across various racing categories, and safety improvements were implemented at Fontana's infield to prevent a recurrence of such a tragic accident. Greg Moore's legacy endured through the establishment of the Greg Moore Foundation, posthumous inductions into the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame and BC Sports Hall of Fame, and the renaming of the go-kart track in his honor. We didn't just lose an amazing race car driver, we lost an incredible person, someone everyone in the racing world loved a favorite among the crowd, and someone who valued family above all else. He had a fantastic personality and was a genuine racer. On the track, his talents were so extraordinary that even world-class drivers wondered how he pulled off such incredible feats. He's often mentioned among the best drivers who never competed in Formula One, and this recognition existed before he passed away. At just 24 years old, he left us with only five victories and we're left wondering how many championships he could have won, or if he would have moved on to Formula One or NASCAR. Unfortunately, he didn't get the chance to fulfill his potential. Some may question the hype surrounding him if they never saw him race, much like another Canadian mentioned earlier. Numbers on a spreadsheet can't capture the true essence of a driver. It's the on-track performances that matter, where you witness those who defy belief and make the impossible possible, just like Jovianov and Greg Moore did. If you enjoy stories about remarkable individuals in the world of racing, consider subscribing to our channel for more inspiring content.